lady, um, I can start with, with ground one. Um, and we've been to the documentation which shows what we know about the, what was destroyed, what was what's missing. Um, the evidence that the warrant, insofar as there was a warrant, um, was destroyed in February 2017. Um, in my submission, there's no evidence that there never was a warrant. There isn't positive evidence there was either. The evidence is that in February 2017, some documentation was destroyed. Um, so it, 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 in my submission, it can't be assumed that there never was a warrant. But what we know and what the likelihood is, is that it was destroyed then. Um, so th that's what's missing, the warrant. What's not missing, however, I've just got to go to some further documentation on that. Um, the court has seen the certificate of conviction um, and in respect of the production of that, could I go to supplemental bundle tab 5, page 143, which explains how that came into existence. This is the, the email. Yes, there's, there's a few emails. Yeah. So on page 143, at the bottom of page 143, there's an email from Albin and Co. solicitors, 5th of February 2020, to the Preston Crown Court. And actually, the substance of the email is on the next page, 144, but in short, it's saying there's an issue as to sentence. Can we have a certificate of conviction, please? Yeah. And then uh, the email uh, chain continues. And if we go back to page, in reverse order, page 142, Um, there's an email of the 12th of February uh, 2020 uh, and then uh, 141 is the next in sequence 14th of February um, and this is an email from the it appears at the court office to a Crown Court judge judge would you please advise read the request below for a certificate of conviction from the defendant's representatives I attach a copy of the defendant's written notice of authority and a copy of the original indictment and result sheet. Unfortunately, the case file is no longer uh, available. Um, can the applicant be provided? And then prior page 140, two emails, um, reverse order at the bottom of the page, 25th of October 2021, uh, an email to justice.gov. Judy, please see the attached. The judge granted the application. You certified it to be a true record. And then the top email um, is an email from uh, to Helen Scott, the Minister of Justice official who produced the witness statement. Uh, good morning. I've returned from leave. You've queried what gave rise to issuing a certificate of conviction. Please see attached and below. It was a quest from Alvin and Co. granted by the judge in February 2020. So that's the position. It, it was it was produced on the authorisation of the Crown Court judge, having seen the indictment and result sheets. So in my submission, it is a document of weight and importance. It's an official document of the Crown Court. It is signed, dated and sealed by an officer of the Crown Court. Um, and it was produced uh, with the authority of a Crown Court judge. Uh, and as to the documentation that he had, uh, the judge had in, in authorising the production of it, uh, if you, the court goes to page 146, you find the, um, what's referred to in the emails as the result sheet. Um, my learned friend took you it's the, to this document in a separate place in the bundle. It's also called record sheet trial. Um, which records the proceedings and on page 147 <coughs> records the um, offences and sentence. Um, and what we, I don't think we've looked at yet is also at page 149. At 149 is the indictment, uh, so which obviously doesn't confirm the conviction, but confirms the offences and their dates, and there's no dispute about this, but just for completeness, it, it's obviously
obviously explicit from this indictment that all the offences are post-April 2005. 15th of October is the unlawful wounding. Um, <coughs> not occasionally, uh, ABH is 14th of May. And then that in hand, handwritten amendment on the next page 150, the common assault is the uh, 1st of May to the 30th of June. So we have the certificate of eviction, we have the court record sheet, we have the indictment. And there's also one further document um, which we haven't looked at, which um, bears, in my submission, significantly on the detention, which is the recall. The court has the recall in tab 3, page 46. Page 46, document headed Revocation of license, uh, license under the CGA 2003. Secretary of State hereby revokes the license commencing 8th of October 2007, respect to Mr. Rowan, and recalls him to prison. Action taken under Section 254, 25th of October 2007. And then the note under that accurately records the effect of Section 254, which is that a person whose licence is revoked is liable to be detained in pursuance of their sentence, come to section 254 in a moment, and may be apprehended without warrant. So because this is a recall case, we don't just have to rely on the original conviction and sentence. We also have uh, the recall document, which expressly authorises detention pursuant to the recall and then pursuant to the original sentence, which is a, adds a further dimension to it. So that's, what the do that's the documentation we have. As to why I say that's sufficient to justify detention and avoid uh, and defeat any claim of unlawful <coughs> detention, um, the, the tort of false imprisonment is the basis of it, or the, the, the components of it are detention without lawful justification. And I'll come to authority for that in a moment. So detention without lawful justification, and that likewise can give rise to an action for habeas corpus. Um, it, in my submission, the what, what that does not require is a warrant. It requires lawful justification, and as the divisional court stated, the sentence provides that lawful justification both as a matter of domestic law and so in respect of the uh, false imprisonment um, and as a matter of uh, Article 5 ECHR, on the basis that Article 5 detention is justified if, in respect of the lawful detention of a person after conviction by a competent court. That's Article 5 1. Lawful detention of a person after conviction by a competent court. And we know that's what we have here because um, there was conviction by a competent court. So, in our case, there's, there's no dispute that the appellant was convicted and sentenced. And a sentence of imprisonment was passed. No dispute that the Crown Court had power to imprison um, because the offences of which Mr. Rome was convicted made him liable for imprisonment, and the Crown Court has power to imprison in such circumstances by its competent court. Um, there's no dispute as to the authenticity of the certificate, certificate of conviction, uh, nor indeed of the trial record sheet or the indictment. So, and there's also no dispute as to the, the recall. In my submission, that all individually or cumulatively provides lawful justification. Um, as the court alluded to from my written submissions, it, it, it cannot be right to make detention contingent on a physical original warrant, in that, that if the warrant is, is lost by fire, flood, or, or indeed less dramatically, simply lost, as in this case. And Mr. Rule's submissions uh, talked about those acts being beyond the control of man, but the more commonplace circumstance might be misfiling the file, accidentally destroying <coughs> it, as appears to have happened in this case. Um, and why should that, in the absence of express statutory requirement, give rise to 
false imprisonment. Um, the, the issue, um, the learned friend Mr. Fitzgerald said, well, you could go and issue, get another warrant. Um, that would still give rise to the problem, as my Lord um, put it, that you, you would necessarily have a period without which, uh, during which there was no warrant. So you'd have to, you'd have to argue that the uh, warrant later obtained somehow covered the period one, when there was no warrant, um, which would seem counterintuitive um, on the basis that the whole argument is that there must be a warrant. Um, So, see, in our, in, our, in an ideal world, warrants would never be lost, um, but in, in reality, mistakes happen, um, and without um, clear statutory clear statutory basis for there being a warrant and that and potentially being contingent on it, in my submission, um, the court should not impose that as a matter of common law. The, uh, there's also the, the recall separately. That, that is, in my submission, a further basis for detention, even if I'm wrong on the warrant, because the, the recall itself justifies detention. It doesn't depend on a warrant. Um, I, I don't... I put that as simply an alternative argument because I would not want to advocate the position that in a non-recall case, so not in our case, but in a non-recall case where the warrant was lost, you would then be in this difficulty where detention would become unlawful. And it's very easy to imagine with the uh, tens of thousands who go through the custody process that warrants may on occasion be lost. Um, and in a recall case, that might be saved by there being a recall. But in my submission, there should be no issue in non-recall cases either. So, that, so that's why you say recall is a further basis for detention in this case. Yes. I also, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald is right that um, certainly warrants are routine. Helen, Helen Scott's evidence makes that very clear. Um, I think it's right to say that they are, what warrants are viewed as an important piece of documentation and they are kept, there's a warrant folder which travels around after the um, prisoner from uh, prison to prison. Um, but it's not the sole document by any means. There's all sorts of other things, the sentence calculations, the indictment, uh, any other relevant documentation. So there is a suite of documentation, all of which is, is important. In my submission, in terms of detention, it, it's not right to elevate the warrant to being a precondition in itself of detention. The, the warrant, as um, Lord Justice Lewis in the Visual Court held, clearly does serve a function. Um, functions plural, actually. I mean, communicating to the prison uh, that a, a person is to be det detained, also separately providing a defence to a jailer in a false imprisonment claim, if in fact the sentence does not justify detention, which is an Im important protection for the jailer. If, if, the, if notwithstanding the sentence not provided for detention, if he's got a piece of paper, an official one issued to him saying, detain this person, he ought not to be liable in false imprisonment. So it can serve that function. But the converse does not necessarily follow. Just because um, it can provide a defence to a jailer, it doesn't mean that if there is no warrant, um, detention is not authorised. Um, so with that, can I turn to some of the, um, turn back some of the legislation um, We've looked already at the, the Prison Act. Could I just go briefly back to the Prison Act for a separate point? It's tab three. Yeah, just before you do that, Mr. Flanagan, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this may, may be as convenient a time as any. Um, <clears throat> what's your submission about the, the, the status of Miss Scott's evidence? M Mr. Fitzgerald, if, if I may say so with respect, rather left his options open, indicating that he didn't object to the court considering it, but... Uh, subject to, as he put it, arguments about admissibility. Um, do, do, do you say it provides um, factual evidence which the court could properly re receive as part of the case? Yes, I do. Um, so I, I, Lord Justice Lewis and um, 
referred the question of admissibility to this court. Um, and rightly noted in my submission that two matters. Firstly, we can't, I can't strictly satisfy the strict lab and marshal tests. I, it is evidence we could have produced below. What happened was that the divisional court made comments about the quality, the extent of the evidence, and we reflected on those and thought the court, this court would benefit from further evidence. Secondly, Lord Justice Lewison also rightly in my submission said that the lab and marshal principles don't strictly apply in the public law context. They're a starting point, but um, the interest of justice can justify evidence being admitted. Um, and in this case, I say that the evidence to which I've referred is, is important, relevant evidence which is admissible and the court should admit it. The, the particular bits I, uh, on which I rely are the, the emails showing how the, the certificate of conviction was produced, the fact that it was produced on the authorisation of the judge I say is relevant and important, the indictment is again relevant to Portman and important, the role that the warrant plays in the warrant folder, that evidence again I say ought to be taken to I th I th and, and, unless I've missed it, and t tell me if I have, but I don't think the court below made a finding one way or the other, did it, as to whether there had been a warrant? No, there's no, no finding at all. No. Hmm. Right, thank you. <clears throat> so the, I, I was going to go to the, the Prison Act, which is at tab three, page hard copy, page 17, which might be 18, I think, electronically. It's section 12. Section 12, 1, provides the prisoner whether sentenced to imprisonment or committed to prison or remand or pending trial or otherwise may law be lawfully confined in any prison. So in terms there, lawful confinement is premised on being sentenced to imprisonment. It's not <coughs> premised on the existence of a warrant. Um, in subsection 3, as, as Gerald points out, certainly the statute does contemplate warrants being issued doesn't make them a precondition, and indeed I go further, and it, 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 in, it, in subsection 1 it's the sentence of imprisonment that's the important thing. Um, that's the Prison Act. Section, if I go to section 254 on the recall, just to make my, give my point on that, um, so that is at tab 10. hard copy section 254 section page uh, 84 trying to copy. Uh, section 254 recall of prisoners while on licence subsection 1 Secretary of State may in case of any prisoner who's been on re released on the basis of this chapter revoke his licence and recall into prison and then subsection 6 bottom of the page on the revocation of the licence of any person under this section he shall, be, he shall be liable to be de detained in pursuance of his sentence, and if at large, it's to be treated as being unlawfully at large. So the statute there provides that the Secretary of State has power to recall and that the person is then liable to be de detained in pursuance of his sentence. So again, it's the sentence that's important, um, no requirement for a warrant. Court has been taken to the criminal procedurals. I don't go back to those. Again, I accept that they certainly contemplate and anticipate that warrants will be produced. They don't purport to um, make detention contingent on the existence of them. So the statutory framework does not um, make detention contingent on the existence of warrants. There's the separate point, I think, that it, if we did have a statute that made that talked about producing a warrant. There would be then questions of whether um, the subsequent loss of a warrant was even in <coughs> breach of such a requirement, or indeed if there was a breach, that that breach led to illegality and unlawful detention. So that's a hypothetical.
But we don't even get to that stage here because we just don't have a statu any statutory framework which requires a warrant in the first place. <coughs> Can I then go to uh, ex parte Evans, make a few submissions on that. So that's tab 19. And within tab 19, can I first go to um, Bundle page 200, which is page 32 of the report, and it's within Lord Hope's speech, and there's a subheading justification for the false imprisonment. And on that page, page 32 of the report, page 200 of the bundle, um, Lord Hope, under that subheading, justification for false imprisonment, states. The tort of false imprisonment is a tort of strict liability. But the strict theory of civil liability is not inconsistent with the fact that in certain circumstances the harm complained of may have been inflicted justifiably. This is because it is of the essence of the tort of false imprisonment that the imprisonment is without lawful justification. And then William Holdsworth, in History of English Law, the defendant could escape from liability if he could prove his act was in circumstances permitted by the law, either in the public interest or in the various defence, uh, the necessary defence for his personal rights and property. Various phrases are used in the text which describe this qualification. Clark and Lindsay refers to complete deprivation of liberty without lawful cause. Uh, Winfield and Jalalovic uh, refers to bodily restraint which is not expressly or impliedly authorised by law. Fleming says intentionally without lawful justification subjecting another to a total restraint on movement. So that is the authority for detention without lawful justification leading to false imprisonment. None of that presupposes in my submission a warrant necessarily. <coughs> then, separate point from, uh, in Lord Hobhouse's uh, speech, <coughs> on which my learned friends rely, um, Lord Hobhouse's speech starts on page 208 of the hard copy bundle, page 40, or zero of the report. If we just pick up a few passages from his speech. In his first paragraph about, um, it's on page 40, letter E. Letter E, uh, Lord House says, on the same day as she was sentenced, an officer of the Crown Court of Cardiff signed an order for imprisonment, which simply stated on 12th of January, 96, it was ordered that the defendant be sentenced to two years imprisonment. It was this document which accompanied her that day to H.M. Remand Centre, Puckel Church, and formed the documentary authority for her retention in, cu in custody thereafter. And it, in my submission, it is relevant how Lord Hophouse characterises the warrant in, in that case. So it provided documentary authority, no doubt. And one can see the need for documentary authority for detention. <coughs> In the present case, uh, for at least some of the time that the appellant was detained, documentary authority did not exist in the form of a warrant, but it did exist in the form of the documentation that I've, I've referred to, the indictment, record sheet, certificate of conviction. So and Lord Hophouse does not deal with, because he wasn't faced with the issue of, well, if you don't have the warrant as documentary authority, what else might might do, if anything. Over the page, uh, page 44 of the report, page 212 of the bundle, letter A, top of the page, what I stated, the first argument controverted the law. The applicant had been sentenced to two years imprisonment the Governor had a certificate to that effect, but that was all. The Governor had no order which directed or authorised him to detain the plaintiff until 15th of November. I'm sorry, what page are we on? Sorry, page, page 212 of the electronic uh, hard copy bundle, page 44 of the report, at letter A. Right, thank you. <clears throat> yep. And the, the, the 
top of that page, the, the, se the <coughs> second line, which I say is of some relevance to the Lord Hobhouse there, re referred to the Governor having a certificate to that effect, by which he was referring to the warrant which existed in that case. But in my submission, it's, it's not irrelevant that he referred to it as a certificate, a certificate of what had been imposed by the Crown Court. In this case, we do have a certificate expressly said to be a certificate, i.e. the certificate of conviction. It's not, uh, except a certificate of imprisonment um, or a, a warrant, but it serves that function of certification of what the Crown Court has done. So in substance, <coughs> it is fulfilling what Lord Hobhouse considered necessary. Um, then the final passage which I need to refer to is at hard copy bundle page 214 which is page 46 of the report and at letter C at, of that page, 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 sorry, page. page uh, 46 of the report hard copy bundle page 214 there's a, the first uh, uh, full paragraph a half a third of the way down begins the critical importance of the warrant and what detention it actually commands and authorises applies both ways as illustrated by the judgment in Zimmer and Cook um, the, I accept of course that Zimmer and Cook is, is referenced there in, in Lord Hobhouse um, it, it places reliance on it but in talking about the critical importance of the warrant and what, it, what detention it actually commands and authorises that has to be read in the context, in my submission, of the his the, the references on the a couple of pages back to Olusu and Home Office and Henderson and Preston. So I just go back to those that there are go back to page 44 for those. Olutu is near the top of the page at letter B, and Henderson and Preston is at letter F. And to go through the detail, but, but the short point in both those cases was that the, the warrant in Alutu and in Henderson provided that the, the jailer could do something different than had actually been provided for either by the court or provided for in law. So in Alutu, it provided for the jailer to detain beyond the sort of relevant time limits. In Henderson, again, it provided for seven days detention as soon as the uh, convict was received by the prison when actually the detention should have started a day earlier. So in those circumstances it's, it's critical to look at the actual wording because it's providing the jailer with a defence and, and that, that point simply does not arise in our case. There's no issue of um, the jailer uh, being liable for doing something different So that's what I say. The short point is that the House of Lords in, in Evans was not faced with the question of whether the legality of detention depends on the jailer being able at any time during detention to produce the warrant, notwithstanding that there might be other relevant and official documentation, including a court record, certificate of conviction, an indictment and so forth. The question did not arise and in my submission, Evans can't be taken to answer that question. So finally on ground one, uh, to do turn to Demer and Cook directly. Um, in my submission, Demer and Cook is distinguishable. Um, it's at tab 11 if go back to it. Page 185, I think, in the electronic bundle. Thank you. Yes. Hard copy, I have it in a different place. 172 under tab 17, but hopefully the court has it somewhere. The demo and Cook, I say, is a, is a case where the entire procedure went wrong on the basis there was a new conviction 
on appeal for a different, well, with a new sentence attached to it. But the old warrant, which related to the old conviction and the old sentence, was relied upon. In those circumstances, it's understandable how the court might have felt reliance on the new warrant. Um, sorry, the, the old warrant, when there had been a new conviction and a new sentence, was impermissible. That is not the situation which arises in our case. Uh, Demo was not a case of the warrant being lost. It was a case of it being a defective and exhausted warrant. In the, in the sense exhausted, in the sense that there had been a new conviction and a new sentence. Demo does not say that if a warrant is lost after imprisonment, then imprisonment suddenly becomes unlawful. So I accept that there is the taken in isolation, the broadly expressed proposition that it's the warrant and nothing else in the last few lines of uh, Chief Justice's um, judgment. But the facts which gave rise to that um, statement were the case of a, a defective and exhausted warrant, not a, a case of a one which has simply been lost well after detention had originally taken place and, as I say, no evidence that there was no warrant to start with in that case, or, or indeed that the warrant was defective. So that's the first point, that it is heavily distinguishable on its facts. On, separately on the law, in my submission, it is clearly contingent on the statutory framework existing at the time in the middle of the 19th century. Sorry, that's wrong. In 1983, beginning of the 20th century. Um, the, in the penultimate, it's on page uh, one, uh, sort of 631 of the report. In the penultimate column of the judgment, if we, if, I'll only press take you to pick it up again, about two thirds of the way down, there's reference to the language of sections 17, 21, and 27 of the Summary Jurisdiction Act 1848, and section 39 of the Summary Jurisdiction Act of 1879, certainly supports this view, either view that the warrant has to be in writing. Uh, and then the other reference to the legislation is further down, about six lines up from the end of that column, still on page 631, the final page of the report, that in the first place, a conviction is not a warrant, and I think, notwithstanding the argument advanced to me by the Attorney General and Mr Avery, that Section 27 of the Summary Jurisdiction Act 1848 does contemplate a fresh warrant being issued after the decision of the appeal. <coughs> so, my learned friend says that what's being articulated here are propositions of common law, but in my submission that that is not right, or at least it should be qualified in the sense that it's also deriving, I say, largely deriving out of the, um, the statutes existing at the time. Um, we have those statutes in the bundle. They are quite long and of limited relevance. Just to pick up one reference, um, the first of them, so the court goes to tab one, which is the Summary Jurisdiction Act 1848. And section 17, which was the first section that the Chief Justice referred to, that's on page 4 of the hard copy bundle. It's in Roman numerals uh, 17, Forms of Conviction and Orders. And it provides that, and it be enacted in all cases of conviction, and if you just skip a few lines and go to the top of the next page, page five of the hard copy. Conviction, and it, pick up from the top, conviction have been therein given or not. It shall be lawful for the justice or justices who shall so convict to draw up his or their conviction on parchment or on paper in such one of the forms of conviction. Uh, and then there's a reference which is to the schedule at the end of this act. In the schedule um, to this act contained, this shall be applicable in such a case. So the legislation there was expressly providing for um, 
warrant to be it, it to be lawful to use those uh, forms of order at the, at the end of this act. So the legislation there, contrary to now, did provide for warrants to be issued, and it, it says it should be lawful for justices to draw up conviction, and i.e., one assumes that if the if the justice were to proceed in a different way, that would not be a lawful form of proceeding. The legislation there was providing for a mandatory process which involved a warrant. That's simply not the case today. The Both of the acts to which the Chief Justice in Demer and Cook uh, referred have both been repealed, the 1848 and 1879 Act, um, and the references, paragraph 16 of my skeleton argument, they were repealed in 1971. That framework has been swept away. They were repealed in. They were repealed in 1971 by the um, Courts Act 1971. There's also a, a separate contextual point on, on Demer and Cook, um, which is more of a subsidiary point, but it's still of relevance. In the 19th century, in an age without modern means of file storage and transfer. It, it is understandable that there was such a focus on the actual physical warrant um, when looking for justification as to detention, which comes through in my submission in Demer and Cook. Um, but it, it, in the modern world, that there's no reason, unless statute were to require it, why that should be the case. Um, it should be permissible to look at the conviction, the sentence, the certificate conviction um, to determine whether detention is justified. <coughs> Finally, I should say that uh, see, I, I don't say it's necessary because uh, to overrule Demer, I say Demer is distinguishable and a case of its time essentially based on the legislation at the time. To the extent that the court disagreed with me, I would invite the court to overrule Demer it being a first instance, first instance decision. Um, but as I say, I Well, those are my submissions on um, ground one. Uh, I was then proposing to move to the sentence grounds, unless there's any other questions on ground one. No, thank you very much. Thank you. So, just dealing very briefly with ground two, which my learned friend described as a transitional ground, in a fair characterization, um, the, the sentence type essentially. Um, in Lord Justice Lewis's judgment to which you've been referred, the, the divisional court um, plainly considered it was more likely that actually a, a 2003 Act, Section 227 sentence had been imposed, um, notwithstanding the, the evidence referring to the Section 85 sentence. And in my submission, that was a, those were legitimate observations um, for the reasons they gave. But the, the real point is that it, it goes nowhere. It doesn't, it doesn't affect matters. Um, the Divisional Court expressly stated that the question of which act the sentence was imposed under is not a matter for this court. Um, and then it moved on to the release provision issue. And the Divisional Court's approach to sentence calculation and the release provision did not turn on whether it was a Section 85 or a Section 227 sentence. Um, because, crucially, the um, sentence calculation argument, the, 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 their reason, the divisional court's reasons on sentence calculation relied on the fact that the legislation ties the release regime to the date of the offence and not the type of sentence. develop that under ground three, my response to ground three, which is the um, release regime sentencing calculation 
ground. And in short, in my submission, the Divisional Court were entirely right that the 2003 Act release regime applied to this defendant, Mr Rowan, from the outset because the legislation provides the applicable recent release regime depends on the date of the offence, i.e. it being after 2000, uh, April 2005, and not the type of sentence, i.e. not whether it's a Section 85 or Section 227 sentence. Um, and the, the appellant is, in my submission, respectfully wrong to say that the 91, 1991 regime applied originally to the defendant and then he was moved somehow to the 2003 Act regime Simply rock night. He was always subject to the 2003 Act regime. There was no uh, moving going on. Uh, so, to explain that more fully, can I first go to the judgment below? Are you still on the transitional? Point? No, sorry, I've, I've moved. You've moved because you're now dealing with whether or not it was um, uh, the the reasons why it was the 03 Act. Sorry. You're now turning to deal with ground three and the reasons why you say the applicable regime was the 2003 Act. Yes, yes, so I'm dealing with that point now. Yeah. Um, and on that issue, can I first go to the judgment below, which is uh, tab nine, the four bundle, uh, paragraph 20. Page 88. And there's a subheading in the middle of paragraph at uh, page 88, the 1991 Act. And in my submission, what you find under paragraphs 20 to 23 is an accurate summary of the 1991 Act position, and crucially for our purposes, I think Mr. Fitzgerald may, may refer to it when I go back to it, but I think it's important, in paragraph 22, five lines in, he said, the net effect of the complex provisions on release appears to be that if a prisoner serving an extended sentence of more than 12 months were released on licence but then recalled, he had to be released on licence at the end of the period equal to three quarters of the custodial element plus the extension period. The license would continue for the duration of the whole sentence, which is sections 33a and 24. So I understand that that is agreed with one exception, that the, the sentence which states the license would continue for the duration of the whole sentence, the learned friend takes issue with that, and I will deal with that and explain why I should say that's correct. So that was the position under the 1991 release regime. Then in 2003, which came into force in 2005, the Criminal Justice Act 2003 introduced a new regime um, in many respects, but one of those aspects was release and recall and release on licence. And it removed the three quarters provision um, and and made licence continue until the end of the, in all cases, the end of the sentence. Then, then we come to the critical um, part of the legislative framework, which is the commencement order. And I'll do this relatively briefly, it's been to, I think, key passages, but just some, go back to it, it's tab 12 of the authorities. Page 126 of that half copy. And so in this commencement order, in Article 2, as my only friend referred to, comes into in the uh, provisions into Schedule 1, coming to force on 4th of April 2005. Um, and if we can just go to Schedule 1, we looked at Schedule 2 earlier, but Schedule 1 is also relevant. In Schedule 1, which is on page 127 of the hard copy, section, uh, paragraph 19 of Schedule 1, 
provides that sections 237 to 244, 246 to 250, 252 to 257, 258, 61, 63, 64, 265, 268, all come into force on 4th of April 2005. Those are, the, that includes the release regime provisions were in chapter two, which are in Chapter 6 of Part 12 of the 2003 Act. So it brings them all into force on the 4th of April 2005. It also does some repealing at the same time in paragraph 44, which is on page 130. And in paragraph 44 on page 130, subparagraph 1, the following entries in schedule 37 brackets repeals. Subparagraph 4, in part 7 of schedule 37 repeals, and the two entries of relevance to us are letter K, the entry relating to the Criminal Justice Act 1991, insofar as it extends to sections 32 to 51 and Schedule 5 to the Act. Sections 32 to 51 of the 1991 Act were the release, it is part two of that Act, and is the release regime in the 91 Act, which the 2003 Act release regime replaces. And then in left, the other entry of relevance is letter R, the entry relating to the Sentencing Act insofar as it extends to sections, and then amongst those long list of sections, 85. The Sentencing Act is the two, uh, Powers of Criminal Court Sentencing Act 2000. So that repeals um, section 85 other than in specific circumstances. So that's Schedule wrong, 1 bringing things into force. And then Schedule 2 um, provides for transitional arrangements. And there are two paragraphs of relevance to this. Paragraph 5, on page 133 of the hard copy, saving provisions relating to chapters 1 to 5 of part 12. Uh, paragraph 5, on the coming into force of the provisions mentioned in paragraph 2 is of no effect in relation to an offence committed before 4th of April 2005. Um, and then letter C in part 7 of Schedule 7 repeals, and then letter uh, Roman numeral 12, the entry relating to sections 85. So preserving section 85 offences for offences committed before 4th of April 2005. And then the other relevant paragraph is 19, which we've been to already. Briefly back to it. Paragraph 19, which is on page 135, saving for prisoners convicted of offences committed before 4th of April 2005. And the coming into force of letter A, sections 244, etc. So that's 2003 Act regime. And then letter C is the other one of relevance, the repeal of sections 33 and so forth. That's the 91 release regime. Is of no effect in relation to a prisoner serving a sentence imposed with respect to an offence committed before 4th of April 2005. So, um, plain and clear, my submission, it, it's, in, it, it's all premised on the date of the offence. That's how these provisions work. It's entirely reasonable legislative choice. Um, 4th of April 2005 is the cut off. If you're after then, in terms of the offence, you, you're put within the 2003 Act regime. If you're before then, you can stay in the 91 regime. And for that reason, I say that the Divisional Court was plainly right that um, the legislation never applied the 91 regime to the appellant. He was always subject to the 2003 Act regime. He, he never benefited from, so far as it's right to call it a benefit, the three-quarter point provision. Um, I appreciate it. My learned friend has a purpose of construction argument, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, in light of my submission, the subsequent changes that were made, in term, most relevantly of, in terms of LASPO in 2012, uh, actually have no relevance because 
the whole argument regarding that is that the, the submission has said that the appellant somehow moved from the 91 regime to the 2003 regime, but, but actually because he was always subject to the 2003 Act regime, that, that submission is only based on a false premise. Um, and therefore, what happened subsequently is of no application to the appellant. Um, I, I just go to it, given the submissions that are made. So, um, the last vote is Schedule 20B. I'll just pick that up again. And it's at tab 10, page 96 of the hard copy bundle. Page 98 is paragraph 3. And in on paragraph 3, uh, subparagraph 1, this part applies to certain persons serving a 1991 Act sentence. The 91 Act sentence is defined in paragraph 1, which Hopefully you'll find on the facing the previous page 97, at subparagraph 9. A 1991 Act sentence is a sentence which is imposed on or after 1st October 92, but before 4th of April 05, or imposed on or after 4th of April 2005, but before commencing date, and is either imposed in respect of an offence committed before 4th of April 2005, or for a term of less than 12 months. So Again, this reflects the commencement provisions because it's all premised on this only being necessary for people who were convicted of offences before 4th of April 2005, i.e. he would have been originally subject to the 91 regime and potentially might be shifted to the 2003 regime by these provisions, but that's not how it's made. So the definition of a 1991 Act sentence means on your submission that you don't actually get to 3.3, paragraph 3, because 3.1 on that application wouldn't apply to the appellant in any event. Yes. Because, yeah, consistently with the, he would, it wouldn't need to apply to him because he was already subject to the 2003. Yes, but just on, on the, stat, imagine there's nothing else. Just on this statutory definition, you say, um, um, he, it doesn't apply to him because the sentence was imposed in respect to an offence committed after the fourth of April. Yes. Yeah, so that's power three one. Then we've got three three, which is the unlawfully large provision. Um, then the the other two paragraphs in Schedule Twenty B, which are relied on a paragraphs 13 and 14. Go to get those there at page 105. And paragraphs 13 and 14 preserve the 2000, and, sorry, preserve the 1991 regime. Preserve it within the 2003 Act. Previously, it had been preserved by the transitional provisions. What happened here was um, it was brought within the 2003 Act itself by Schedule 20B. Um, paragraph 13 again reflects this distinction between pre and post April 05 offences. So, paragraph 13 1. This paragraph applies to a person who, A, <coughs> has been convicted of an offence committed on or after 30 September 1998, but before 4th of April 2005. B, is serving a Section 85 extended sentence. C, released on licence under Part 2 of the Act, 91 Act. And D, has been recalled before 14th of July 2008. Um, and then paragraph 14. It's 
22 so that preserves the three quarter provisional going to print red out but 14.2 is only engaged if you come within paragraph 13 so 14.2 if a person to whom paragraph 13 applies is serving a sentence with a custodial term of 12 months or more duty of sexual state to release the person on license as soon as the person would but for early release has served the period by founding period found by adding three quarters of the custodial term plus the extension so 14.2 is of no application to a person convicted of an offence after 4th of April 2005. And that's because the transitional provisions meant that such a person was already, already subject to the 2003 Act regime and therefore no further uh, provision needed to be made for him. So I say the reliance on 14.2 is um, ill-founded for that further reason. So that's Schedule 20B. Um, the return to the, the purposive approach advanced by Malone and Friends, which as I understand is the, the response to the commencement order is, the, is plain, that determines matters. Um, it, it, in my submission, it, you can't, it, it, it wouldn't be a purposive interpretation, it would be rewriting the 2005 order. That's what, that's what it's intended for. You can't interpret the 2005 order in any other way. It's clear. Um, and it simply said that it shouldn't say what it says, which is it's not a purposive interpretation in my submission. Um, and nor can it be said that the draftsman would have intended a the 91 regime to apply to a sentence erroneously imposed under the 2000 Act when it should have been imposed under the 2003 Act. Um, because that is operating the legislation in a way that compounds the initial error by then having further um, errors, essentially, as the court below put it. You can't assume that the draftsman contemplates um, errors of that sort being made not within the uh, intention of the draftsman. Separately also, at the heart of my Leonard Prince submissions was the idea that a Section 85 sentence had to be subject to the 91 Act release regime. That was said said it, that's the classical position it was put at one point and it, it was said as almost as a truism 80, section 85 sentences 91 act regime <clears throat> in my submission there is no essential link between a section 85 sentence and the 91 act regime where, where it, whereby it must follow that you have to use the 91 act release regime with a section 85 sentence and we know that because the, the, the legislation has moved Section 85 sentences in some circumstances to the 2003 Act release regime. An example of that, which we've just been looking at, is Schedule 20B. Another example, which is even clearer, um, we haven't looked at it yet, I'll just go to it. It's um, there's a, a, the 2008 Act, not the part of the legislative chronology, is at tab 6 of the authorities, page 44. And so at tab 6, page 44, section 50A of the 1991 Act, enforced from 14th of July 2008 to the present. And this was a section brought in by the um, uh, Criminal Justice and Immigration Act 2008. It's not directly relevant because it, it dealt with recalls after 2008 and our recall happened before 2008. 
but it shows that the legislation can move people who have Section 85 sentences to the 2003 regime. So, subsection 1, this section applies to a person who's released on licence under any provision of this part, that part being part 2 of the 91 Act, and is recalled to prison under Section 254 of the 2003 Act. Subsection 2, nothing in the following provisions of this part, which authorise or require the Secretary of State to release prisoners, applies in relation to the person. Section 33 and so forth. So those are all 91 Act release regimes, and none of those apply anymore. And then subsection 3, sections 254 and 6 and 255A to 256A of the 2003 Act, which authorise release on licence, etc., apply in relation to a person to whom this section applies with the modification set out specified in subsection 4. So what, what that is doing is it, it, it's moving certain prisoners who are called post-2008 from the 91 Act regime to the 2003 Act regime. So it shows the lack of an essential link. And then finally on this point, the 2003 Act regime can cater for Section 85 sentences. And we see that in authorities tab 10, uh, section 255A, which is at page 85. Section 255A, page 85 of the hard copy bundle, further release after recall. And sections 255A, B and C are the current sections dealing with release after recall. And subsection 1, this section applies for the purpose of identifying which of, subsection, of sections 255B and C govern the further release of a person who has been recalled under section 254. And it's subsection 7, which is of relevance, it says, an extended sentence prisoner is a prisoner serving an extended sentence imposed under A, section 266A, section 266B, those are extended sentences under the 2003 Act, um, and then 7B, right at the bottom of the page, section 85 of the Powers of Criminal Court Sentencing Act 2000. So the, the, the 2003 Act at present does happily cater for further release after recall of section 85 sentences. So that is another example in my submission of the legislation expressly showing how a section 85 sentence can be subject to 2003 Act release provisions, as this, it provides for here. So that's my submissions on purposive interpretation. Um, and then a few final points on ground three. Um, to do with the licence in particular. I think that the first point to make is that the but for the licence dates, this appeal would be academic. Um, because the, the appellant calculates a release date of 25th of October 2021. The appellant was actually released on 13th of September 2021, over a month in advance of his three-quarter point alleged release date. So... He, he obviously didn't, he, even if he should have had that benefit, which I think is not what I say, he, he didn't, um, wasn't deprived of it, he, he got released in advance of it. The, the only issue arises that, is that the appellant was released on licence on 13th of September 2021, and the licence expired on the 7th of June 2022. And it's said that, as I understand, that the 
the release at 25th of October, the three quarter point should have been unconditional, and therefore there is an issue as to whether that, that license should be closed. On the license, the correctness of the license, the, I think there's no dispute that if the appellant was subject to the 2003 Act regime to start, from, to start with, that license was correctly imposed. I think the, um, the argument rests on the 91 Act regime. But under the 2003 Act regime, licenses last until the end of the total aggregated sentence always. And that section, the references are section 249 and section 264 of the 2003 Act. I don't understand that to be controversial. Um, the issue I understand is if the, the appellant should have had the benefit of the 91 Act regime, when would the licence have stopped in that case? In my submission, even if the appellant was subject to the 91 Act regime, the licence would still have continued until the end of his sentence. And that's the case whether it's under Schedule 20B or the original 91 Act. Under Schedule 20B, the word, let me pick this up when I went to it, it's bundle page 105. Paragraph 14.2, which is the paragraph relied on in the second line, expressly says... Sorry, but I'm sorry to be slow. My page reference has gone wrong. What page, please? So it's page 105 of hard copy. 105, I'm sorry. I thought it said 185. No, no, it's 105, paragraph 14. Yeah. Paragraph 14.2, if a person to whom paragraph 13 applies is serving a sentence with a custodial term of 12 months or more, it's the duty of the Secretary of State to release the person on licence as soon as the person would go forth. Those words can only mean that the person's licence must continue beyond release. Otherwise, they would be, but they would make no sense. That is consistent with the position Sorry, I'm not just. And the court might say, well, it says on license, but it doesn't say on license until when. Yes, it doesn't. But um, section 249 would apply. So section 249 says that licenses expire at the end of the total aggregated sentence. And so that is the, that's the provision which would get you from on license to that license expiring at the end. And it, it's, it's notable in that respect that Schedule 20B does in some places disapply Section 249. Um, if you go to paragraph <coughs> 17, 3, for instance, on page 108. Page 108, paragraph 17, 3, says subparagraphs 1 and 2 apply in place of Section 249 duration of license. So it's plain from that that where 249 is not disapplied, it applies. And so it would apply in set paragraph 14. So that's the position under Schedule 20B. And then uh, my Lord asked my learned friend as to the position under the Criminal Justice Act 1991. And the position there is the same, that the licence in, in a recall case would would persist until the end of continue until the end of the sentence. It's a it's slightly not the most obvious uh, wording used to explain that, but it is clear. It is it is, it is right in the submission, um, and 
So if I could go to the 91 app to explain that, it's that 91 app is at tab 5 of the bundle, page 29. duty to release short-term and long-term prisoners. Subsection 1 deals with initial release of short-term prisoners. Subsection 2 deals with initial release of long-term prisoners. Subsection 3 deals with subsequent release after recall of, of prisoners. So as soon as a short-term or long prisoner who's been released on licence and has been recalled would but for his release have served three quarters, it shall be duty of Secretary of State to release him on licence. But then, in our case, it's subsection 3A that applies, because that deals with extended sentences. In the case of a prisoner to whom section 44A applies, section 44A is extended sentence. It shall be the duty of the Secretary of State to release him on, on licence at the end of the extension period within the meaning of section 59. So again, you have the words on licence, which can only mean one thing that you, he's not released unconditionally at that point, he's released on licence. Again, the same question would arise. Well, that says release on licence, it doesn't expressly say when the licence continues to. To understand that, that's where it becomes slightly more complicated. Um, the One has to go to um, section 44, which is on page 39. Section 44 is extended sentences for sexual violent offenders. Section 44.3, where the prisoner is released on licence under this part, the licence shall, subject to any revocation under section 39, remain in force until the end of the extension period. To understand the end of the extension period, you have to know when it begins, and that's explained by subsection 5. The extension period shall be taken to begin as follows. For the purposes of subsection 3 above, on the date given by section 37, 1 above. So that takes us back to 37. And that's on page 34. So section 37, both 1 and 1a are relevant. Subsection 1, 37, subject to subsection 1a. 1B and 2, where a short term or long term prisoner is released on licence, the licence shall, subject to mere revocation under section 39, remain in force until the date on which he would, but for his release, have served three quarters of his sentence. So that's the, that's the, uh, the position where you, you the, of initial release. In initial release, the licence expires at the three quarter stage. But then subsection 1A, where a prisoner is released on licence under section 33 or 3A above, subsection 1 shall have effect as if for the reference to three quarters of the sentence, there were substituted a reference for the whole of that sentence. So that, that tells you, in slightly circuitous fashion, that for a re-release after recall of an extended sentence prisoner, the licence continues until the end of the sentence. So, Respectfully say, my learned friend is incorrect to suggest that the license expires at the three quarter point in a recall case like a re release after recall case like this. And there it, is. Just as a matter of um, clarity, really, um, in 37 1, 
three quarters of his sentence, presumably meaning for the three quarters of the entirety of the sentence, both custodial period and extended license, not three quarters of the custodial sentence. by virtue of breaching his license with, with one bound he'd be free of everything yes my fingers hit, sorry. The, 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 the sentence uh, an extended sentence is one sentence it, it comprises two two constituent parts but an extended sentence <coughs> of let's say two, two years custody and three years extended license is an extended sentence of five years. Yes, I, well, I'm great. I hope I haven't. But I, I, well, I can see the force of that. I think the statute might operate uh, slightly differently in that both section 33.3a, which is on page 29. <coughs> Section 44.2, which is on page 30. Just, just, so, sorry, um, is, is the answer provided by section 85, um, subsection 2 of the 2000 Act, which is at tab 8, which defines an extended sentence? Yes. It supports the point that my Lord just made, um, subject to blah, 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 Court may pass an extended sentence, that is to say, a custodial sentence, the term of which is equal to the aggregate of the term of the custodial sentence the court would have imposed if it had passed the custodial sentence otherwise than under this section, the custodial term, B, a further period, the extension period for which the offender is to be subject to a license is for such length as the court considers necessary for the purpose mentioned in subsection 1 above. So, in other words, the whole sentence is the custodial term plus the extension period. Yes, that does treat them humans to be. But 44.2 may, may override that potentially. This is on page 39. Section 44.2, subject to the provisions of this section, section 51.2d below. This part, exception, section 48, shall have effect as if the term of the extended sentence did not include the extension period. That would appear to separate out the custodial element. Right. Does separate out the custodial element and it's yeah. the, the three quarters relates to the custodial element and you add the extension period on. Um, but you don't, in a recall case, the license doesn't disappear at the end of that extension period. There is still the, you still get released on license at that point, not additionally. Right. There is. There is some authority, it's not directly on point, but I think it might assist to at least some extent <coughs> on how these sections operate. Um, it's in the case of Kelly, which is tab 27. Which is at, it starts at page Four four six of the hard copy bundle. And on page four 
five two judgment of or justice laws. In the first few lines on paragraph one, page four five two, claim that three appellants were all sentenced to five year terms of imprisonment for serious offences. So not extended sentences, but nonetheless still assist to some extent. Each was at length when the each was at length released when three quarters of his sentence had elapsed. They were released on licence and not unconditionally. The issue in these appeals is whether that extension of the licence period until sentence expiring was lawful. And that depended on the commencement order, which we're now familiar with, which has been the subject of much litigation. Um, but there's a, at the bottom of that page, there's a subheading, the position under the amended 91 Act. And that's why I go to this case. So, Law Justice Laws at paragraphs 4 to 6 explains the workings of the 91 Act release provisions, not expressly in terms of extended sentences, unfortunately, for our purposes, but does provide a, an explanation of how it works. He says amended because it's as it was amended in 1998 by the Crime Disorder Act. Um, and it, it's at some length, but the at paragraph 6 on page 453, his reasoning takes him to this conclusion that each of these claimants was in fact released at the two-thirds point of his sentence, thereafter recalled, and then, as I have said, re-released at the three-quarters point. Had those events all happened before 4th of April 2005, the release of each claimant at the three-quarters point would have been on licence and not unconditionally. Sections 33, 3, and sections 37, 1A would have applied. So that was dealing with a non-extended sentence, section 33.3, rather than section 33A. So the position there is that in a recall case, the licence continues till the end. In my submission, that is also correct in terms of an extended sentence. There's no reason why it should be any different. Um, and so I think that's sufficient, actually. Those are, those are my submissions on ground three and the sentence calculation of the release regime. I'm going to turn to ground four, finally, human rights arguments. Uh, my principal submission on this ground is that the appellant's human rights arguments fall away with the divisional court's correct findings in my submission on the operation of the sentencing regime because the actual effect of the legislation is that the appellant was never subject to the 91 regime because the offence is post-dating April 2005 and the appellant's alleged breach of articles 5, 7 and 14 are all premised on the appellant being moved from the 91 regime to the 2003 Act regime. That's a dead false premise and the human rights arguments fall away accordingly. Um, and if the appellant was always subject to the 2003 Act regime, there can be no Article 5 breach. He was subject to a lawful sentence of conviction, no Article 7 retrospective change, and no discrimination under Article 16. Um, I, I do propose relatively briefly just to address the position in the alternative, given the submissions were made on it. If I'm wrong, that there was some movement from the original 91 regime to the 2003 regime. The, um, the court below did briefly deal with this alternative position, but, but not fully, given their findings. So if, if it, when the court goes to its core bundle, tab 9, Uh, page 98 
judgment, uh, a paragraph 55 to 58. Divisional courts, they're dealing with Article 7, specifically. And paragraph 56, the court below essentially says, because there was no changing regime, the appellant was subject to no breach of Article 7. Paragraph 57, however, the court, say, the court said, secondly and separately, in any event, if there had been any changes in the arrangements relating to release on licence, they would not constitute a change in the penalty for the purpose of Article 7 of the Convention, but would relate to the manner or execution of the penalty. The total penalty of the Crown Court imposed remained the same. See decision of European Court in Albanian um, and Divisional Court in Park. So the, that's the court, and I say that's correct. It's right, say so the court didn't expressly deal with that alternative position under Article 5 or Article 14, Article 14 separately, but obviously it didn't need to given its findings. Um, so what I say, those findings under Article in respect of Article 7 in paragraph 57 are correct, but there is a, a well-established distinction between the penalty imposed and the means of its enforcement or execution, and that changes to release arrangements are in the scope of the latter, i.e. enforcement or execution, and don't violate Article 7, heavier penalty, or Article 5, terms of foreseeability of detention, um, rather they are, those changes are foreseeable. Um, and the detention is justified throughout the whole term by reference to the original sentence. And can I return to Calm to make that good? It's at um, tab 37. very end of the Khan judgment on pages 665 and 666. Paragraph 121. Yes. The, the court neatly brings there together, together some principles. Um, 121, Roman 1, early release range do not affect the judge's sentence and decision. 2, Article 5 of the Convention does not guarantee a prisoner's right to early release. Three, lawfulness of prisoners' detention is decided for, dur for the duration of the whole sentence by the court which sentenced him to the term of imprisonment. Four, sentence of trial court satisfies Article 5 on throughout the term imposed, not only in relation to the initial period of detention, but also in relation to revocation and recall. <coughs> Five, fact that a prisoner may be expected to be released on licence before the end of the sentence does not affect the analysis of the original sentence provides legal authority for the tenth detention throughout the term. An article, a paragraph one two two, deals with the Del Rio Prado case, and the Lord Lord Justice Holroyd asked a question as to foreseeability of changes in release arrangements. In my submission, the answer to that is found within paragraph one two two, um, five lines into paragraph one two two, the end of the fifth line, the court stated, "It is entirely foreseeable." if necessary, with appropriate legal advice, that during the currency of a determinate sentence, which was calculated and imposed without account being taken of the possibility of early release, the arrangements for the execution of the sentence might be changed by policy or legislation. <coughs> Accordingly, lawfulness of the sentence is not undermined or undermined by changes of the sort made by the 2020 Act. So, um, changes in release arrangements are not they are foreseeable. Um, I accept that the, the, the court was dealing there with, a, <coughs> with a, a standard determinate sentence, so to speak, not an extended sentence, which is a form of determinate sentence, um, but does have an extension period, which standard determinate sentences don't. But it, even if there was this move from the 91 regime to the 2000 regime. The effect of that is that 
rather than release at three quarter point of the custodial period plus extension period. The um, prisoner would be not entitled to release that earlier point and would have to serve potentially the entire of the custodial period. So that quarter of the custodial period, which previously he would get automatic release, in effect, of, he loses that. So the, the change, if on the hypothesis there has been one, relates to the custodial period of the extended sentence, doesn't relate to the extension period. So in so far as it's said, and I'm not sure it is against me, but so far as it was said, well, these are standard determined sentences without extension period. Well, I say that's not a relevant distinction given what the change here would be about the custodial period in any event. Um, still on Article 5 and 7, can I also go briefly back to Stellato, which was relied on, um, which is at tab 26. And it's the final page of Stellato on page 445. Four, four, and paragraph 44 is relied on, as I understand, for the principle that um, as Scott, or Justice Scott Baker articulated that existing prisoners should not be adversely affected by changes to the sentence regime after their conviction. In my suspicion, that must now be read in the context of, of Khan explaining that in terms of release arrangements, you can, those can be changed foreseeably and not unlawfully. It, it's also relevant what was going on in Stellato, where it was all about interpretation of Again, another case on the commencement order. And the Secretary of State was arguing for a, uh, uh, an interpretation which was said not to be the normal natural meaning. And at paragraph 45, Lord Brown stated, the result for which the Secretary of State contends would, in short, be a surprising one, unlikely to have been intended by the legislation. And if it were intended, one would expect it to have been enacted in the clearest of terms. So far from that being the case here, all the indications are, as I've explained, sort of explained, strongly to the contrary. So that was a case where the legislation was was clear the other way. Um, it, in, the, in the present case, the legislation is clear. The commencement order in 2005 um, is entirely clear that if the offence is post-April 2000, 2005, you're subject to the 2003 Act release regime. So, insofar as Stellato does um, enunciate a general principle about not adversely affecting changes to serving prisoners, it, it contemplates that you can do so with express language. And express language is what we find in the 2005 Act. Those are my submissions on Article 5 and 7. Finally then, uh, Article 14 and discrimination. Can I deal with this by reference to what Article 14 provides for, which is most clearly articulated in the judgment of, in Stott, which is, we haven't looked at the evidence, it's tab 39. And paragraph 7 and 8, which is page 707 of the bundle, hard copy bundle. And at paragraph 8, um, Lady Black, I know she's now well, she used passage, explains that there are four elements um, to establishing a breach of Article 14. In order to establish a different treatment amounts to a violation of Article 14, it's necessary to 
establish four elements. First, circumstances must score with an ambit of Article Convention right. Secondly, difference in treatment must have been on the ground of the characteristics listed in Article 14 or other status. Thirdly, claimant and person who has been treated differently must be in analogous situations. Fourthly, objective justification for the different treatment will be lacking. So, again, on the hypothesis, there was a, a move from the 91 regime to the 2003 regime, whether there has been discrimination. The first of those elements, I, I, I accept that release regime arrangements fall within the ambit of Article 5, no dispute there. You can't um, dispute that. It, it's the se second, third, and fourth elements which I say that Pallant falls down on, because the different treatment must be based on one of the grounds, characteristics listed in Article 14. You have Article 14 still in the, the judgment of paragraph 7, claim that. sex, race, colour, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, association with a national minority, property, birth, or other status. As I understand, it's other status <coughs> that's relied on. It's fair to say other status has been said in some cases that it can include a sentence of imprisonment or, for instance, a life sentence. But the, the, the key point here is that the different treatment is not due to the sentence, it's due to being unlawful in detention. In so far as Schedule 20B did apply, the appellant would be, um, it, it's, it would be disapplied to the appellant by him, the appellant being unlawfully at large, and the complaint is made about that. So, it's not arguable in my submission that being unlawfully at large is an other status for the purpose of Article 14. It has nothing in common with the other um, matters listed in Article 14. It doesn't relate to a personal characteristic or any social or personal status. Um, there's nothing in Strasbourg jurisprudence which says being unlawfully at large is a status of some sort. Um, it would go well beyond case law, and there's no obvious reason why the European Convention on Human Rights would, would seek to protect the status of being unlawfully at large, which is what the, the effect of making it such a status would do. So that's the second test. Um, let me fall down on that. The third requirement is the appellant and the comparator must be in, in analogous situations. Again, I say that they're not on the basis the appellant is unlawfully at large. The comparator has, whether voluntarily or uh, by force or been captured, been returned to prison. So someone in prison is not analogous to someone who's still voluntarily unlawfully at large. Can't be the right comparison. The appellant also falls down on that. And then finally, objective justification, I say, insofar as it's needed, exists. Um, and the, the objective justification is that by the 2012 Act, Parliament sought to move more comprehensively to the 2003 Act release regime. Um, Schedule 20B brought in by the 2012 Act, provided for those still subject to the 91 release regime to remain subject to it while their sentences ran their course. Um, but as, those, as their sentences expired, so would the 91 release regime <coughs> expire. Um, those unlawfully at large, however, were moved straight away to the 2003 regime. And the rationale is because to do otherwise would essentially mean that the saved provisions would have to be preserved indefinitely. Because who knows when unlawfully at large will return to custody. That is, in my submission, a reasonable, uh, legitimate objective. Um, 
and no reason why Parliament cannot decide that those on Northern Large should be moved straight away to the 2003 Act regime rather than being kept within the 91 Act regime. Um, so that's what that that was the intention of what what it was doing. So far as it so far as it is necessary, there was a just objective justification. For Unless I can assist further, those are my submissions. No, thank you very much. Yes, Mr Fitzgerald. <coughs> well, in relation to the warrant point, um, it's in relation to the warrant point, uh, the court ha has our basic submissions, but we, we say um, that on the facts, uh, my learned friend submitted that the evidence was um, that, that, that there was a warrant, but at some stage it was lost. I, I, I would simply say that there is no conclusive evidence that there ever was a warrant, but um, it's sufficient for our purposes that there wasn't a warrant in 2019. Um, and he then relied on various matters that there were to say that makes the uh, detention lawful. So he said, for example, well, there's a certificate of conviction, but so th there was a conviction which had been um, witnessed uh, by the prison officers in the Dima and Cook case, and that was held not to be enough. Uh, he said then, secondly, that the, um, the there was the Secretary of State's order recalling him, um, but that is a, a, an executive act um, which depends for its lawfulness on the lawfulness of the underlying sentence uh, and detention. Um, and um, the, the point is that the, the law, the common law has held that that underlying lawfulness must be established by a warrant. Uh, common law is only one way to prove that the uh, uh, detention is lawful. So it can't be sufficient just simply to say, well, there's a, a, an order from the Secretary of State. Um, and um, we submit that the claim that the recall justifies detention um, because the recall is, is simply an executive act um, it do doesn't stand up to scrutiny. So we rely still on the on the basic common law principle in Deemer and Cook and say that it, it does require uh, a warrant. My, my learned friend went through the, 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 the legislation he went through of section 12 and he said that it lays down no preconditions and we accept that um, uh, and the section uh, 254 uh, also about liable to be detained in pursuance of the sentence the question is how does the jailer uh, satisfy um, a court legitimately in accordance with the authorities um, that he has authority for detention uh, uh, and the authorities say that that is by producing a warrant. Um, and um, ex parte Evans, um, my own friend took me through it to try to show that it was a different situation. But the real point there is that um, Lord Hobhouse expressly adopted uh, and approved the, the words um, in Deemer and Cook that the warrant and nothing else um, is the authority for detention. In other words, the warrant and nothing else were expressly approved. Um, and so uh, on those basis we say that there is uh, an underlying principle that the warrant and nothing else is the authority for uh, detention. Um, we say that the Deemer and Cook case is not distinguishable on the facts um, uh, and um, that, that there it was specifically held convictions not a warrant um, and that the uh, evidence that there was that there had been a conviction was not enough in the absence of a specific warrant. The Summary Jurisdiction Act is about the forms um, and not about the underlying um, um, justification for detention. And then finally, my learned friend submitted that you can overrule DEMA. We would respectfully submit that that would be inappropriate. Um, firstly, um, it's been approved what um, uh, uh, Lord Elveson said in that case. Um, in the um, House of Lords, as it then was uh, in Evans, 
um, and it is a, a principle which clearly builds on a series of earlier cases, uh, a principle we say um, of, of common law. Um, those are the, the submissions we make in relation to the warrant. Um, and then turning to the question of the release calculation, um, the everything depends on the significance of the fact that the only evidence that is is that this was a sentence passed or reportedly passed under section 85 if we are to attribute any significance to the fact um, that it is declared to be a section 85 sentence then it's not for the executive to turn what is a section 85 sentence into a section 227 sentence um, or to treat it differently, uh, which is really um, what is being said. Um, uh, my, my learned friend then submitted that it's um, more likely, um, the, the, the finding that it was more likely that it was a section 227 sentence um, was, should be upheld um, for the reasons we've set out, we would say um, the simply insufficient uh, evidence to, to justify that when the only two documents that exist say that this was a section 85 um, sentence. And indeed, in order to deal with the warrant point, my learned friend relies strongly on those memoranda. And yet, when they don't suit him, the memoranda are thrown away and um, are, are of no assistance in establishing that this was, in fact, a section 85 sentence. And, and then, really, the hard <coughs> case is um, that as a section 85 uh, offender, and could only get a section 85 sentence before the 4th of April 2005. You, that's the only way you could get one before that. He was entitled to be treated in accordance with that sentence, even if the offences were post um, April 2005. Now, I, I, I accept, as I said throughout, the, the difficulties of how you deal fairly with an unlawful sentence. It's obviously not going to fit in um, to either of the um, regimes, naturally, as, as, as my learned friend um, uh, pointed out uh, when he addressed you um, in following. Um, it wouldn't, if you treat it as a um, section 227 offence, there are also problems. Um, but the net effect is, we say, that he was entitled <laughs> If it was a section 85 sentence, then he was entitled to be released um, at the three quarter point of the custodial sentence um, plus the extension period. Now, that's preserved in paragraph 14 of Schedule 20b, even now, uh, for those. Um, who were sentenced under Section 85. Uh, and if one simply disapplies as not fitting in the precondition of before, sorry, that the offences have got to be uh, committed before April um, the 4th, um, 2005, um, then this is a case which should attract the safeguards um, under um, Schedule 20B 14.2. Uh, and, and, and we also um, um, pray in aid of purpose of construction of paragraph 19. Again, you, you, you can't make sense of, of um, how to do justice to a section 85 sentence uh, if you insist uh, on the sole criteria of being uh, the date of the offence, because we know the date of the offence was after, but nonetheless the judge imposed the section 85. Sentence. Um, so either you, at the executive level, just disregard the fact that those that, that he purported to impose and, and stated that he did impose, and it's lawfully um, valid, um, a, a Section 85 sentence, and just disregards that, or you, you, you seek to do the best that can be done within the framework um, of the legislation um, to provide
provide the regime which is appropriate for a Section 85 sentence. And that, that obviously requires um, reading um, the various uh, provisions um, in a, a, a purposive way that um, doesn't treat the fact that the sentence is in past, is past but the offence is committed after April the 4th, 2005, um, as um, an ir irresolvable problem. Now, if I can just take you then to how we say it can be done, if you look um, with uh, uh, just very briefly at again the passages that my learned friend took you to, one sees um, in the LASPO uh, Schedule 20B, which is inserted, one sees Section 85 with an extended sentence is referred to at page 97. Um, and it's referred to at one subparagraph five. Sorry, page. Pa page 97, my lord. Page 97. It expressly refers there to uh, uh, page 97. A section 85 extended sentence means an extended sentence under section 85 of the Sentencing Act, which includes uh, uh, etc. So, so it's, it's intended to cater for Section 85 extended sentences. This, and and what, what this schedule is, is trying to do is to do justice under a new 2003 scheme to those sentenced um, under earlier schemes, including the Section 85 cases. Uh, and um, one sees, uh, 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 as my learned friend took you through, paragraph three, this part applies to certain persons serving a 1991 Act sentence. Well, again, section uh, 85 is, in our respectful submission, such a sentence, and it's clearly covered. Um, um, I don't understand that submission, I'm afraid. The, a 1991 Act sentence is defined. I'm so sorry, my lord. A 1991 Act yes, sentence yes. is defined. Yes. It has a specific meaning in accordance with the Act. Yes. And it has to be for an offence, sorry, a sentence imposed in respect of an offence committed before the 4th of April. So you have to say the definition yes. should be effectively modified yes. to include your point that Section 85 uh, somehow trumps <coughs> that. Yeah, well, my lord, yes. Uh, the, I mean, it, 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 Yes. Yeah. It, 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 that your lordship is correct that, that we have to read, read in and to those those um, which effectively have to be treated as 1991 sentences. Yeah. Your lordship, because they're section 85, and it clearly was intended to deal with section 85 extended sentences because they're, they're there in the definition section right at the start. Yeah. Um, and if we go on to um, uh, the Section 13, this paragraph applies to a person who, now of course we have to accept um, that this is someone who was not um, convicted for offences before um, 4th of April 2005. <coughs> However, you've got to give effect to B too, is serving a Section 85 extended sentence in imposed in respect to that offence. How, how, how are you to do any justice to someone who's got a Section 85 extended sentence who, because of the quirks of this particular sentence, um, is not um, convicted for an offence um, before 4th of April 2005? It is by, by reading down um, giving a purpose of construction, however one formulates it, or otherwise they're left with no regime at all. And um, Well, they could, they could always appeal against their sentence. Um, yes. It, it, if a person had been made subject yes. to a, a regime premised on his being a dangerous offender, uh, and he wanted to argue that he wasn't, and he said the judge had got it all hopelessly wrong and imposed the wrong sentence, he can go to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. Well, my my lord, I I, I accept that, but, but but which hasn't happened here, is no, it? No, my lord, I no, my lord, I do accept that. Um, the the only point is the <coughs> the executive uh, law is that it has to be treated as a section eighty five 
sentence until it's set aside. And when he was recalled, obviously, that was the position. Um, <coughs> so you have the curious position that that was the sentence. Um, and the sentence, the, the fact that it's a Section 85 sentence has to be respected until it's set aside. So we, we respectfully submit that, that, that there can't be a vacuum. There has to be some adaptation of the parole regime. Um, but, but there isn't a vacuum because he's subject to the 20, uh, 2003 Act regime. Well, but, but, but the 2003 Act regime is, is applies to people <laughs> under Section 227, which he wasn't. It doesn't apply. Well, it, it, it's your submission. That yes, it sorry, was it? Yes, yes, sorry. The, 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 the judge found otherwise. Yes, no, no, I, I accept that. If, 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 in fact, he wasn't sentenced under Section 227, then he is not someone who's covered by the 2003 Act. He's covered by, but he can be covered by Schedule 20B, um, which is intended to deal with, with um, uh, Section 85. Well, my, my Lord, I, I, I don't want to just repeat all my submissions. I'm just trying to, because, because this was a new point about um, uh, paragraph 3.1 and then <coughs> about paragraph 13a, this is fine. Uh, and um, we would submit um, that um, he should get the benefit <coughs> of, of, of um, paragraph 14.2. Um, and well, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I'm trying to ponder what the answer is to the, to the point that your logic make, makes about whether you can appeal your sentence. Um, it is true, as one could, the, the trouble is, what is the sentence you're appealing against? It's very difficult because. Well, your, your argument is mm. that we are to <coughs> say the judge was wrong in his finding. And we have to proceed on the basis that the judge actually pronounced a sentence under Section 85. Yes, yes. He, if he did do that, <coughs> there would have been a cast iron ground of appeal, wouldn't there? Because he could only pass a Section 85 sentence if the custodial term for offences of violence was four years or more, and, and it wasn't. And on your hypothesis, because we're to assume the judge would have declared it to be a Section 85 <coughs> sentence, <coughs> which would not require a finding of dangerousness, then there would have been no finding of dangerousness. And, and therefore, not only would uh, the appellant have a cast iron ground of appeal, but he'd be secure in the knowledge that he was bound to do well on sentence, because he couldn't then be made subject to a Section 227 sentence, because there wouldn't be any finding of dangerousness. And in any event, Section 11.3 of the Criminal Appeal Act would have prevented a, a sentence more severe. So, um, with respect, I uh, understand, yeah. of course, your point that by the time he's recalled, yeah. having been unlawfully at large for more than a decade, yeah. um, but things have moved on. But m what, uh, what I'm bound to say <coughs> has been passed over in the submissions is that as at the date of sentence, the appellant and those advising him would have had every reason to appeal on your hypothesis. Yes. Well, so the, uh, well, uh, so one sets out against what you say rightly in, in one sense are two documents saying it's a Section 85 sentence, but the second document is 15 years later and is merely based on, on the first document. <coughs> so it's really one document. Um, <coughs> yes, well, my Lord. Hence, perhaps, the divisional courts finding that it was more probable that it was a Section 227 sentence wrongly <coughs> noted by the court clerk. My Lord, uh, it, oh, 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 <coughs> <laughs> I can't, really, all we can do is come back to the basic proposition. Yeah, well, I understand. That is, that, that is, that, that, that one's, in the absence of an appeal, the sentence stands, it, the, 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 the executive is bound by the pattern of Section 85 and must do justice to that. Uh, and we, we respectfully submit that it doesn't do justice to it um, to um, disapply paragraph 14. Whatever the um, point about discrimination being justified, it would not have been in our respectful submission uh, uh, um, foreseeable under Article 5. Uh, 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 and at the 
time that he departed. And and my, my lord, can I and my lady, can I just make this point? Almost all, well, I think all of the cases um, saying that there's no Article Five right are about a fixed term prisoner saying, "Can I get out?" As it were, they're saying you have no right to early release. The sentence uh, justifies your detention. But again, almost all the case law recognises that conditional, when you acquire conditional liberty, this is a, a, a very significant thing. You are entitled to enjoy your normal life again, your freedom. Therefore, we do submit that, that if one looks at it at the point, of it, the point in time where he is conditionally released, he was entitled to expect being subject to a 85 sentence. <coughs> That if recalled, uh, he would be entitled to re release um, at, at the um, three quarter point, and that it is not foreseeable um, that that conditional liberty on, on that basis with those um, consequential, I suppose, legitimate expectations um, could, could just simply uh, be frustrated um, fairly. And that, that's the reason that we I I invite the court um, to. Uh, read in to paragraph uh, uh, 3, 13, uh, and 14, 2, um, the uh, ability to rely. Uh, we, we accept, of course, that things have moved on uh, since the um, appellant made his initial application. When he made his initial application, he'd been told, you've got to spend eight months longer in custody unless you're released by the parole board um, than you you contend is just. He, he happened to be uh, released in the discretion of the parole board, but we do submit that he's entitled to a declaration, uh, if we're right, um, that he was um, in, in, in entitled um, to be released, um, to be released on the 25th of October. My Lord, I do accept my learned friend's point on your Lordship's point, but that's to say that the, the release would, would would have to be on license. Yeah. I think. I think uh, having gone through those uh, statutory provisions, it seems clear that the release would have to be on license. Yes, that's only subject to the points made at page 171, 172, which would only apply to the reading of schedule. Um, uh, to, uh, to the reading of um, the, the, the schedule, but, um, but but it does appear uh, clear that um, the release to which you were entitled. Three quarter point under the 1991 Act was released on license. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Fitzgerald. We'll just um, rise for a couple of minutes to take stock of this situation. <coughs>
Mr Fitzgerald, Mr Rule, Mr Flanagan, we're very grateful to you all for your very clear submissions. Um, we've <coughs> completed the, the hearing within one day, which is much to the credit of, of, of all of you. Uh, we will, as you will not be surprised to hear, uh, reserve judgment. We will, in the usual way, circulate a draft in due course for correction of any <coughs> typographical errors and the like, though not for further argument. And we'll aim, in, in the now usual way, to hand down remotely. Um, when we circulate the draft, we'd be grateful if <coughs> Council could liaise with a view to agreeing the terms of an order. And should anything be incapable of agreement, any consequential matter, um, if brief written submissions could be made initially, and, and we'll consider whether anything further is, is needed. All right. Thank you all very much.